So what's going on guys, DIY Dan here again, and this is another episode of Backroads Arizona. In this video, I'm gonna be installing an electric winch into my 26 foot enclosed trailer. Now, originally I was planning on putting this in my toy hauler, but it ended up being a lot bigger winch than what I thought it was gonna be. So it was gonna be too big for where I intended to use it in my toy hauler. So I decided to put it in my enclosed trailer instead. I will be purchasing a smaller electric winch to install in the toy hauler at a later date. So this is the winch that I got off of Amazon, guys. I actually paid around $250 for it. It was a little cheaper when I actually purchased it than that picture is showing. So this video is gonna go over step-by-step -step installation, including the mounting of the winch, the wiring of the winch, and then I actually added a solar panel to keep the battery charged for that winch. So let's get to it. Now, even if you didn't buy this specific winch, what I go over in this video will apply to pretty much any electric winch installation no matter the brand or model. I decided to anchor my winch up on my workbench. The reason I did this is when you mount it right to the floor, if I'm dragging something in from behind the trailer, that rope is gonna rub on the back of the floor because of the angle. So this gets it up nice and high where that won't be a problem. Plus it gets it up nice and high to make it easier for me to operate because I'm not getting any younger. Now, because the top of this workbench is made of wood, I did have to have an extra plate of steel to make this sturdy enough to hold it. So this is a quarter inch plate, 16 inches long by about 10 inches wide that I ended up using for that. So I've got a beam that comes right across here and then I've got this beam across here. So we're gonna anchor it through, two bolts through this and one through the center of that. And then I'm gonna bolt the winch itself to this. So right here, I'm just measuring the width of that plate and marking center. And then I measured underneath the beam running across the front. That was about inch and a half. So I went three quarters of an inch in and I just set those an inch in from each side. The bolt pattern for the winch was 10 inches by five inches. My plate was 16 inches wide. So I went in three inches on each side at that three quarters of an inch from the front of that plate. Then using a square, I marked back those two lines at those three inches from each side and marked those at five inches. I was basically five and three quarters of an inch from the front of the plate because I set those back three quarters of an inch to make sure I hit that front beam right in the center. Then I used a center punch to mark them out so I could throw them on my drill press. When drilling steel, I always like to use some type of a cooling so I don't burn up my drill bits almost immediately. So right here, I've got a plastic tub with just a submersible aquarium pump. It's hooked up to a quarter inch PEX line with an inline ball valve. And then I've got a quarter inch copper tube that I can kind of adjust. And I just held that with a hose clamp to the drill press. Now, is this setup a little ghetto? Absolutely. Was it inexpensive and effective? Absolutely. Now, I don't drill a lot of steel. So the good part about this is too, is when I'm done drilling that, I just take that little tub out from underneath it, go dump it in the yard, and then I can put it back, and when I need it again, I just put a little bit of water in it, and I'm good to go. You also want to put your drill press on a much slower speed so you don't burn up the drill bits as well. I drilled all seven of the holes, the three that are going to hold this plate to the brackets in the trailer, and then the four for the winch, and brought it into the trailer. I set that plate on the workbench, made sure I was centered, and then drilled my holes through the beams. When using a hand drill to drill through steel, there is a couple things you need to be careful of. I'm gonna go over the technique that I've used that served me well in the career I'm in over the past 15 to 20 years. When starting to drill through steel, you wanna use a low speed and high pressure. So it takes out a large amount of material in a short amount of time so you don't burn up your drill bit. As soon as I see the tip of the drill bit start pushing through what I'm drilling, I switch from low speed, high pressure to high speed, low pressure. So you're taking out less material because if you try and take out too much material as you do the final push through, the drill might lock up on you, seize up, and rip out of your hands. Now I'm talking about this using a high-powered drill. Even this rigid would have a hard time ripping it out of my hands. But with a heavy-duty half-inch electric drill, it is a possibility and it can get you hurt. The other option is if you're not familiar with drilling steel also and you're using a battery-operated drill with the torque setting, Instead of setting it to the drill setting, you could set it to the highest torque setting. The drill might stop on you a couple times, but it's not gonna rip out of your hands when you're trying to push through that final part of the steel. Another thing that might help you push through that steel is getting your body weight up above what you're trying to drill so you can really push down on that drill as you're pushing through that steel. 
When drilling from the side of something, I've had somebody stand behind me so I could leverage against their body to help put more pressure. Or if it's in the right situation, I've actually used a pry bar to help push down on the drill and leverage against something else to give me more pressure to push through that steel. When it's possible, I like to drill one hole and anchor it in place with a bolt to hold that plate before drilling the other holes, just so I don't get off a little bit when trying to mark them and drill them which is what I was able to do in this situation. Then I went ahead and drilled my two other front holes and then the four holes for the winch. Now I did end up with two extra holes at the front of this plate because I could have theoretically used the two front bolts for the winch to hold to the front beam, but I didn't know if I was gonna end up wanting to set that winch a little further back on that plate when I initially measured everything out. But it's better to have too many bolts than not enough in this situation. As far as the hardware I used, I actually used grade 8 bolts, but I wouldn't go with anything less than a grade 5 bolt. And then I did use washers on both sides and at least a nylon nut. I don't like to use lock washers and regular nuts in this situation because lock washers tend to work better if you can really squeeze them down tight on the material you're trying to hold. I could not do that because the beam material was thin where if I really put a lot of pressure tightening them down, it would start bending that beam. So with a nylon nut or a lock nut, it will hold wherever you put it. That doesn't even mention the fact that I'm also going through a three quarter inch piece of plywood, which will also compress, which is another reason why lock nuts or nylon nuts are a much better option than a lock washer in this situation. I used fender washers as much as possible on the bottom side of all these bolts. The reason being is I'm either going against wood or the thinner material beams and the more surface area you have to pull against, the better off you are and the more strength you're gonna have. On the top side of the plate, I didn't care what size the washer was because there was a lot more strength than that quarter inch thick steel plate I used. Now I know I said I wasn't a big fan of using lock washers in this application, but I didn't really have a choice for the winch itself because there were square drive nuts that fit into a slot and then you just had to run a bolt in through the bottom to that winch. Now another trick I learned about drills that I was not aware of until after this happened, you'll notice that in this clip, my drill bit actually fell out of the chuck. I've had this happen to me several times. It's always pissed me off. On a lot of drills these days, especially with the battery operated ones, there is a lock on your chuck. So right here, I'm just putting my drill bit in and locking it in place. If you take your chuck and just turn it a little bit, you will feel a detent. And that is actually locking that chuck so it will not loosen up while you're drilling. This rigid drill actually labels it right on the chuck itself. And right here, you'll notice that you can hear the detent as I go back and forth with it. I've actually had this drill for like 10 years and I barely found out about that like three weeks ago. So right here, I'm just attaching the hook to the end of the rope on the winch. Now, a lot of people don't know this as well is there is a certain way that you put the clevis pin in the hook. You always wanna install the clevis pin this direction where the cotter pin is going in at the back of the hook. The reason being, and this is a lot more critical when it's heavy duty chains and chain binders and stuff like that, is when you're going to attach that hook or lock, latch it onto something, you don't accidentally hit that cotter pin and possibly push it out of the pin, and then your pin comes out and you possibly lose your load. And you might think I'm crazy on that, but I've actually seen it happen and almost lost a load on a trailer. You can also choose to put the pole strap on it if you want to. It just clips over and gives you something to grab besides the hook. There was only one piece that you really had to assemble on the winch, and that is set the solenoid box over the top of the winch. It hooks over the front, and then there are two set screws that you tighten down to hold it in place on the back. As far as wiring it in, they did give a detailed instruction of what connection points on the solenoid box you make to the winch itself and then to the battery. You're just gonna make all those connections according to what it tells you in the actual manual. Be careful with tightening these down I am using a 3 8 ratchet, but you'll notice doing the final torque that I'm not using the full leverage of that ratchet. A quarter inch ratchet would actually probably be a good option for tightening these down. My opinion of the electrical and the way they did the wiring on this winch was pretty good. They had nice clean connections with rubber isolators to go over each one of the positive connections. One thing that I did not notice at first was the main ground connection was directly underneath the motor of the winch. So that would have been a lot easier to put on before mounting the winch, but I was able to get it on there. Just make sure you check your connections. If you run into this problem, just connect it before mounting the winch. There was also a small ground wire that ran from the solenoid box 
over to the same location as the main ground hooked up that connects to your battery. I ended up using a ratcheting gear wrench in order to tighten this one down because obviously I could not fit my ratchet between the motor of the winch and the workbench. Now the one thing that did piss me off about the way this winch came was the positive cable only had like a 5 16 hole in it for the battery and positives on a lot of batteries that are stud are 3 8 so I did have to drill that one out a little bit. If you are having to do this also, make sure you hold it with a pair of vice grips. Needle nose vice grips work best because you can hold it literally right next to where you're having to drill it because that drill will tend to torque and pull on that cable pretty good while you're trying to get through it. And once again, you want to use high speed with low pressure, so hopefully it reduces the chances of that. Now this trailer did already have a battery in place, however, I didn't like the location of it. It was down underneath some cabinetry, so it was a pain in the ass to get to, and I did end up relocating it to up top on the workbench behind the winch. I bought this battery tray off of Amazon. The reason I really like this one is because it actually used a bracket to hold the battery in place instead of a strap. In my opinion, the ones that use the strap are a piece of crap because the straps deteriorate over time and you can't really pull down tight on those straps to begin with to hold the battery snug. Another thing I liked about this tray was the holes to anchor it in place were on the outside of the tray itself, giving you a 100% positive seal tray so if you get a battery acid leak, there's no chance of it making it down or out of that tray. Whereas with the battery boxes, sometimes you have to run screws down inside the box which does give you that chance of that acid leaking past those screws down onto my workbench and possibly damaging it. Now being as though this trailer already had a battery inside of it, there was a charge wire ran through the vehicle pigtail to keep that battery charged while you're running down the road. However, this wire was all melted down and causing a short to ground, so I did have to rewire that on this trailer. Now keep in mind, I bought this trailer used and that's how it came to me. So right here, I kind of cleaned up my wiring underneath. I added a junction box and ran two brand new wires from that junction box up to charge my battery when I'm running down the road. If you end up having a similar problem, I highly recommend getting a junction box because junction boxes make it much easier to diagnose a problem if you're having it in your trailer because you can pull one wire off at a time to help isolate that wire that might be the problem. Another thing I do on any of my trailers that house batteries in them is anchor a solar panel somewhere on the trailer in order to keep that battery charged so I don't shorten the life of that battery. So right here, my trailer's got a little bit of a tilt on the front of it, so it's gonna get plenty of sun sitting in my side yard to charge the battery. I drilled a large enough hole to run the wires through right behind where the solar panel is gonna mount, and then I used silicone to seal that wiring up. Then I used four screws to anchor the solar panel to the front of my trailer. I put silicone in each one of the holes before running the screws in so I didn't get any leaks into my trailer. I recommend getting a solar panel that has the display to show you what it's actually doing and the voltage that it's putting to the battery. All right guys, so here is the final wiring to the battery. I know it's a little messy. I've got to clean it up. I haven't quite decided how I want to do it. Here is the main positive going to the winch and the main negative, that's your two main connections. Then this with the circuit breaker is actually a uh, power wire that was ran to run the interior lights in my trailer. And I've still got a problem with those lights. I got to figure out, uh, like again, I bought this trailer used and there was some stuff wrong with it when I got it, but I got a good deal on it. So I'm making deal. Here is the main positive and negative that I've got running down to the vehicle harness. So it keeps the battery charged while I'm hooked up. And then this is my positive to the solar panel and the negative to the solar panel to keep it charged when it's sitting in my side yard. There's two ways to control the winch. One is with the corded remote that just plugs in and there's an in and out button on that. And then there is a remote. In order to activate the remote, you have to hold the in and out buttons at the same time for five seconds to turn it on and activate it. And then it does work in and out just like the corded remote. There is also a lever to engage and disengage the winch so you can quickly unspool it in order to hook it up to whatever you're pulling in. Now when you go to re-engage that lever, you might have to bump the in and out buttons just a little bit to get it to pop into gear basically, but it really hasn't given me any issues. So right here, I'm going and hooking this to my Project Sand Car to pull it inside the trailer. And it did pull this thing without a problem. Now this is a very light chassis, but this winch is way overkill for what I purchased it for. It also comes with a decorative guide plate if you choose to use it somehow. I just didn't need it. 
The next video coming up in regards to this trailer will actually be me replacing the electric brakes on it because whoever had it previously was not adjusting their brake controller correctly, overheated the brakes, and burned them up. That video will include disassembly, inspection of wheel bearings and brakes, and then reassembly, including the packing the bearings and the bearing adjustment. I will also be going over adjusting your trailer brake controller so this hopefully doesn't happen to you in that video. So that's going to wrap it up for this video, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed it and it gave you some good information. If so, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. If you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it. The whole concept of my channel is to give you guys the most information in the least amount of time as possible so I don't waste your time. And I hope to see you next time. Have a good one. Later.